A few years ago, a concerned resident opposed a four-story apartment on this site in their Edmonton neighborhood by saying, More apartments are economically unnecessary and actually unwanted by the community. We know what it means when homeowners don't want new housing nearby, but what does it mean for an apartment building to be economically unnecessary? Well, he said his neighborhood already has an abundance of apartment buildings, with the majority having vacancies. He mentions another proposed development, and expresses fear that his neighborhood will become overrun with apartments. This is a mess of a contradiction. On one hand, he's saying there's already plenty of vacancy in existing apartments and no need for more. But also, he's saying his neighborhood is threatened by developers who want to build a bunch of new apartments. What does he think is happening then? The developers are about to make bad business decisions, building apartments they won't be able to sell or rent? That's possible. Sometimes businesses misjudge demand, but probably not. They're the ones who know the industry and market. They're the ones who actually have to sell or rent the apartments. They don't always get it right, but they're much better positioned and motivated to judge demand than neighboring homeowners who have no skin in the game, and worse, who are actively biased against neighborhood change. It's like asking BlackBerry in 2006 if the world needs the iPhone. Of course they'll say no. But what we're going to do is get rid of all these buttons. What a lot of housing skeptics misunderstand, intentionally or not, is that density is not arbitrary. Density follows demand. Nobody tries to build skyscrapers in small towns or rural areas, because there's no reason to. Land is abundant and there's room for most people to live in standalone homes if they want. At most, you might see townhouses or small apartments for seniors or small families who don't want as much space. But the flip side of this is that if you live in a city and people are trying to build denser buildings near you, there's a reason. There's demand to live there that's not met by the current lower densities. The reality that density follows demand contrasts with the pervasive view of infill housing development as this arbitrary thing done to communities, essentially mining or exploiting the neighborhood character in service of developer profits. You can see this back in 1926 in a major court ruling on zoning, which said that apartment buildings are mere parasites constructed to take advantage of the open spaces and character of a district. Until, finally, the residential character of the neighborhood and its desirability as a place of detached residences are utterly destroyed. More recently, a local resident in Toronto spoke out against a new housing development with a telling attitude. The developer is asking for the privilege to change the nature of the community. I repeat that it is a privilege to be allowed to build and profit in our community. The framing of housing development as profit extraction from a community, instead of providing a basic good that people want and need, is really pervasive. Obviously, developers are motivated by profits, like other businesses. But they make these profits by selling homes that people want to rent or buy. You don't have to love developers or even capitalism to see that businesses who build housing are better positioned to judge demand than comfortably housed neighbors are. Actually, if there's a problem with relying on private development, it's not that they'll build too much housing, it's that they'll build too little, especially during economic downturns when private investment dries up but housing needs don't. Many NIMBY narratives basically function to uphold the idea of density being arbitrary exploitation of a community. The myth of abundant vacant apartment buildings allows people to oppose new apartments without dealing with the human reality of housing demand. Other people focus on Airbnb gobbling up new housing supply, but in most places it's small fish compared to demand from long-term residents. Consider this comment. You build more housing, and people just scoop them up and rent them out as short-term rentals. It's not as easy as building more homes. But the details matter. Yes, Airbnb can put pressure on housing supply. No, it does not take up all or most new housing, in a way that lets you dismiss the importance of housing construction until Airbnb is banned or something. Exaggerating or obfuscating the details on vacant homes or Airbnb functions to paint new housing development as arbitrary and unrelated to demand from long-term residents. The inability to recognize or believe that density comes from demand leads to a weird framing where zoning reform is seen as being about developers versus homeowners, with little mention or concern for the people who actually live in the new, denser housing. 
One article in the Vancouver Sun responded to the province eliminating zoning that mandated single-family homes by saying, This is great news for developers, but how will it affect BC communities? It goes on to say that this will lead to a dramatic densification of suburbs in the semi-rural outskirts of cities and towns. But that only happens if there was a ton of unmet demand to live there. Density is not arbitrary, and people don't build apartments just for fun. The only mention of people actually living in, or benefiting from, new, denser housing comes at the end of the article, where they say the real problem is immigration-driven population growth. It's frustrating when commentators who argue against housing reform only mention demand and need for housing when they have policy levers to make those people just go away. But let's imagine the federal government decreases immigration, lowering but not eliminating the need for new housing. Does that mean we can keep single-family zoning restrictions that ban denser housing from large parts of our cities? This article is set up for the answer to be yes. If there's no demand for denser housing, we don't have to legalize it. Okay, but if there's no demand, why is it important to keep banning or restricting it? That's the paradox of density restrictions from our perspective. If there's no demand, why do we need the rules? And if there is demand, maybe the rules are harmful. On top of this, judging demand for housing can actually be difficult. We don't have all the information, planners and politicians included. And we all have our own biases, based on what kinds of housing we live in or like. A lot of the time we project our own needs and preferences onto other people. That's why urban planning should be based more around giving options than trying to micromanage small details of what we think people want or should want. So even though immigration obviously affects demand for housing, just like migration within a country does, we think we should loosen density restrictions regardless of what immigration rates are. The idea that density comes from demand, and developers don't build apartments just for fun, is one of those things that seems obvious when you explain it like that. But when you pay attention, you'll see these misunderstandings everywhere. Last year, local residents fought against new apartments by an office complex in Gilbert, Arizona, southeast of Phoenix. We don't need any more apartments, one resident said. Another one explained that workers at the office park earn a high income and want to live in a single-family home, not an apartment. And anyway, people who want to live in apartments don't want to live next to their job. But why are residents or governments the best ones to judge this? The developer clearly thinks there's demand and they can sell or rent the apartments. If they're wrong, they'll just have to lower rents. Who cares? Are we really trying to stop them from making a bad business decision? We don't need any more apartments isn't mainly judged in relation to demand. It's judged in relation to people's abstract ideals of what a city should look like. Sometimes it comes from a place of, I already have a home. Why do we need any more homes here? What we want to see is people thinking harder about the goal of density restrictions. Do we think they line up with people's preferences for housing anyway, and thus don't really change anything? In some places, that's probably true. Or do we think they have big impacts on where and how people live? One Dallas city councilor expressed worry about housing reform in Austin spreading to Dallas. Start paying attention or you may live next to an apartment, she warned. What's the theory of housing that she's proposing? Is she saying that there's a lot of unmet demand to live in her neighborhood that the government is currently blocking? What are the downsides of distorting our cities like that, not just in her neighborhood, obviously, but on a bigger scale? When we say that density follows demand, we should mention that demand is obviously influenced by policies and infrastructure. Building a bunch of highways through your central city will decrease demand to live there and increase demand to live in the suburbs. Building rapid transit will increase demand around wherever the stations end up. Thanks for watching through to the end of the video. Don't forget to bike and subscribe. And a special thanks to our supporters on Patreon. 